Pray that your road is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Oh, I don't know if I can pronounce this word. Lystragonians, Cyclops, angry Poseidon. Don't be scared by them. You won't find things like that on your way, as long as your thoughts are exalted. As long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lystragonian Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside you, unless your soul raises them up in front of you. Pray that your road is a long one. May there be many a summer morning when full of gratitude, full of joy, you come into harbor seen for the first time. You may stop at Phoenician trading centers and buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfumes of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can. You may visit numerous Egyptian cities to fill yourself with learning from the wise. Keep Ithaca always in mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for. But don't hurry the journey at all. Better if it goes on for years, so you're old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you've gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. She hasn't anything else to give. If you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you have become, and so experienced, you'll have understood by then what Ithaca means. Our theme for the month is the father. I was going to come up here, June is men's month, yeah, uh, but I just, I'm still working on it. Yeah. Bringing that degree of masculinity uh, to the fore. Um, as such things often happen, I'm a big believer uh, or experiencer of synchronicity. Have you ever heard of synchronicity? This is this uh, term coined by uh, Carl Jung, uh, where he called it a causal connecting principle. So for example, a synchronicity might be that you uh, say, oh, June is men's month, and then inside, like I was, you're saying, like, oh, man, well, I really got to work on my, like, daddy issue. My, my like men, I think I need to find a men's group or something like that. And then uh, this morning, I got a chance to be manly. It was it was great. <laughs> manly, sorry, we're in a postmodern world. Manly. Um, but you know, I had to feel manly because I woke up and I'm sort of like dragging myself with a tea in one hand and all my stuff in the other hand to the car. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I parked in, so I have to move that car. And I look up and there's a giant tree parked behind my partner's car which had fallen down in the night. So I had to go, I found out how unmanly I was that I didn't have a saw just in my pocket. I, was like, I knew I was a very strong pocket knife that I thought about using a little bit to down in my feet. Uh, but I found a saw, and I spent this morning sawing apart a tree so I could get out of the driveway. Uh, and to me, all I could think, being a firm believer in sickness, I was like, well, isn't this just healing. So, like my own dad right now. Um, it's so positive. Right? That was actually pretty fun. I, I, it really woke me up better than any latte. Uh, uh, did I just reduce my masculinity by saying latte? <laughs> okay, so uh, there are plenty of jokes that the dear old dad within can be subject to. And he doesn't mind because he's a man. But the truth is that our world desperately needs to heal its masculine. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. I, I don't think I'm alone in thinking that. Um, with that, we should say that for a long time, women's work has probably been more important. Why? Well, it's silly to think of healing the poor old privileged class. Oh, Poor men, they need healing. They only still make 18% more than women. Like, how, how is this the 21st century? I thought we'd have like Jean-Luc Picard like flying by and, you know, like Jane, Captain Janeway, you know, I'm sure Captain Janeway made the same. It's like amount. 200 years from now, right? Yeah, but come on, we got the internet. Our internet service is better than theirs. Our, our iPhones are at least as good as a tricorder. We could have equal pay. 
for women. Right? So for a long time, it was a lot more important for women and feminist men to get together and heal the damage and the wounding that has been done to the collective feminine by the collective patriarchy. Um, so women's issues have been important for a long time, but we all have an inner man. And it's important, I think, now for us to look at the <coughs> other half of the patriarchy, that you can't make a dominator hierarchical structure without people whose hearts aren't hurt enough to turn them into dominators. So there's some deep work that needs to happen in the masculine if we're going to be able to help the world that we all share, women, men, and people who refuse or don't care to identify as one or the other. We all have these forces of femininity, masculinity, and all of this past history that needs to be threshed out. Okay, our inner man, you've all got one. And he's so far, archetypally, the guy who goes and does business and the guy who goes off to war. These are basically his job. We can say, well, a woman can go do business. And, you know, I saw G.I. Jane, and now, you know, years and years later, the army started to, like, uh, get on the... And yet, for thousands of years, we've had implanted in our psyche that this is men's work. So if we don't heal that man, the one who exists inside the feminine each of us, the one who exists in our boys, who we send to public schools, where no matter how feminist your household might be, how egalitarian your Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of uh, wherever it happens to be, is they're still being indoctrinated with a good five, ten, 100,000 years worth of archetypal structure. This is something we have desperate to to heal. So that's our theme for the month. I think we should be able to do it by July. As much as we all should be all taken care of. Okay, another great quote from Carl Jung. Um, he says, until you make the unconscious conscious, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. <coughs> until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. So that's a lot like that poem that we read at the beginning. You know, there aren't any cyclopses and those other guys, and Poseidon, I can say Poseidon without looking at the paper. None of those guys exist except for the ones that you brought with you on the road. Right? So very similarly, if we don't, get, you know, there's no real daddy issues out there. There, there are wage in, inequalities. There are systematic sexism out there. But the triggers and the things that keep us from being able to work with them are in here. If we make that unconscious material conscious, it stops being a force of destiny and becomes a motivating factor, an empowering factor. So Carl Jung called this shadow work. Right? Has anybody heard of shadow work in my sermons or elsewhere? Right? So the shadow is often that which you deny about yourself and therefore must project upon others. You can have dark shadows, and you can have golden shadows. Right? Oh, I could never be as powerful a speaker as Reverend Von Juno. <laughs> uh, because it's something that you deny in yourself. Right? The strength of your denial will lead to the strength of your trigger about the projection. Either you think Reverend Von Juno is the best forever, ever. <laughs> Don't think that one. It's OK. Uh, or you think, you know, that guy up there thinks he has a leg to stand on and talking about patriarchy, but in fact, he is one of them, and he is a dominant. Oh, okay, right? Because if we repress in ourselves, the fact that these elements exist, even in seed form, they're going to leak out through the edges. We know somebody is a dominator. We know someone is a powerful being of compassion. We know someone reminds me a lot of my dad, it must be you. It couldn't be me. It's impossible that that could be me. So shadow work basically says to us that what you repress 
still gets expressed. Right? You can push it down as much as you want. It's still going to find a way to leak out under the edges. So it's a wonderful chance to look at when we look at the archetypes of the human spirit, especially when we look at the archetypes of the masculine. We have a chance to see, oh yeah, there's, there's some of that, that Apollonian flavor there, and I really like it. Or there's some of that Dionysian flavor there, and that really scares me about myself. The more we make these things conscious, the more we have a repertoire of skills that we can use in creating harmony and peace with each other. When we take this basic gross material that we all come factory equipped with, and we shine the light of consciousness on it, that becomes art. This is the ancient art known as alchemy, where you take gross materials and you turn them into gold, or you turn them into some kind of philosopher's stone, and no matter what you touch it to, it turns into gold too. Have you ever seen art that was kind of dark? a little bit terrible, and yet so moved your heart that your mind was changed forever. We, each of us, can be that kind of art by bringing the unconscious shadow material, this dross that lives inside of us from our thousands and hundreds of thousands of years of history and indoctrination into the light of consciousness and making it beautiful. All right, so each of us have an inner man, and we need to heal this inner man. If you've ever looked into men's work, anybody here ever done men's work? No men or men? Yeah. So if you've ever looked into men's work, there's a lot of emphasis on healing the inner man. And it can get, honestly, as a practitioner of men's work, um, I can say maybe not for any of the other men, but I'll call my own shadow, it can get a little narcissistic. It's true. Okay, has anybody ever done uh, women's work? Women's work healing the. Well, you guys, we got to start some men's work. <laughs> okay, so, but all this emphasis on healing, you know, and it's good, I think, for men to learn how to cry. We we actually were never tar taught the art of weeping. We were never taught the art of grief. Most of us, maybe you grew up in a UU household in California come help me. Um, but many of us were never taught this art. There's a certain point, though, at which healing, just like anything else, becomes an unending well. You could heal and heal and heal your inner masculine, and you're never going to run out of tears. The more I focus on me, the more I focus on what you're never going to run out of things that are wrong with you and your life. But if we think of healing in the ancient root of the word, which means to make whole, we can find a way to bring our inner masculine into a union, into a wholeness with our inner feminine. We can find a way to bring the inner man into a union and a wholeness with the rest of society that he has to walk in, and with the earth herself that we live on. OK, so the greatest of the dichotomies in our inner man is between these two characters, Apollo and Dionysus. Who's already heard of Apollo and Dionysus? Okay, some of us had to like learn myths in Sunday school or uh, grade school or something like that. So what do you remember about Apollo? Anybody remember anything about Apollo? Who is he? Allison? He's intensely logical and everything is um, without without emotion, it's using it's using your analytical brain and staying away from anything that feels like he did. Yeah, he's aloof and he's rational. Yeah. What else? What else do you know about Apollo? God is sun. He's solar. He's a sun god. Ra ra ra. God of poetry, god of healing, and god of diseases. Poetry, healing, and disease at the same time. So he's one of these good old old world gods who brought medicine to the earth and sometimes sends a plague. Sort of at the end. <laughs> okay, anything else that you know about Apollo? He had a girlfriend, right? Yeah, a couple. Of, he's a great god. He ran around. Yeah. He was Artemis' brother. So in case you didn't know, Artemis, the silver moon goddess, they're both archers. 
by the way. What else? Anything else? And then he's, uh, he's this younger generation, right? So you've got uh, Oranos and Gaia gave birth to uh, the Titans. And then the, I think the last one, no. Then there's uh, Kronos and somebody else. And then that's that generation. Then there's Zeus. And then these are the kids of Zeus that we're talking about. Okay, so we're, we're stepping down from, in, to mythologists, these would be deep archetypal forces, into archetypal forces that kind of really work with the life that we're living. Okay, how about Dionysus? Does anybody know about Dionysus? The god of wine. The god of wine. Yeah, so some mythologists say, oh, in, in Rome, he was devolved into Bacchus. Right? Um, and you can, you can kind of see this. So he gets characterized as just a plain old god of drunkenness. But he's actually he's kind of a complicated figure. But yeah, god of wine, god of the vine. What else do you know about Dionysus? Party guy. He's, he can be a party guy. But yeah, Dionysus is not very well known. Do you notice this? Who knows Apollo and all these hands on him? And then Dionysus. Why? Yeah, yeah. More earthly. I, I know that guy. He's, the wine guy, right? <laughs> yeah. And this is going to show us something really interesting. That the values of our culture tend toward the Apollonian and tend to avoid the Dionysian. More on that once we learn what the heck Dionysian is. So Dionysus is a god who died and rose again. Um, he was a god of magic wine. It starts to sound kind of familiar, actually. Uh, Dionysus was initiate in the cult of the Great Mother. So he was a priest of the goddess as well as a god at the same time. Oh, that's not cool. He was characterized by wildness, yeah. which is similar to his drunkenness, but there, it's distinct. There's both drunkenness and wildness. These are, these are two different things. I heard once, I'll have to check the reference on this, but that many Dionysian followers didn't physically get intoxicated. They were just tasted the wine until they felt a uh, subtle change in their spirit. And then they would spout poetry and sing and dance and make love in the mountains. All that kind of thing. So I think it was uh, Nietzsche who started this, but there's this philosophical trend of opposing or contraposing, juxtaposing the Apollonian and the Dionysian. Because in each of our psyches, there is part of us that prizes order, rationality, aloofness, solar qualities like the light of day, bringing everything to light. And there's another part of our psyche, perhaps unknown to many of us, who uh, successfully completed the indoctrination process of living as a good citizen, that is wild, frenzied, likes to sleep in and have brunch instead of coming to fellowship on Sunday. Uh, likes music and not that harp stuff. Not, not Apollo's instrument is like the lyre. Not lyre music, like liar music. <laughs> I'm a liar. Yeah. Uh, so in the world, what inspired this sermon to me, what inspired my talk originally, I was reading this book by an author who I mentioned before, his name is Ken Wilber. He talks about a lot of this stuff. Some people like him, some people hate him, but he's got interesting things to provoke thoughts. And he was talking about the wild man archetype. I mean, who's heard of the wild man archetype? So this is big, if you're into the men's work, one of the things that you'll read in these, you know, Robert Bly books, you know, these, these great Sam Keen, these men's work books, is that we have to re-invoke the wild man archetype. Okay? So what I want to ask you, do you think we need to re-invoke the wild man archetype, like these books say. Who, who votes, yes, we need more wild man archetype? We define it. Yes. Define it. Yeah, wild, wildness. You know, freedom and spontaneity and, and power and uh, lust and uh, anger. No, no, freedom and spontaneity. Okay, so the wild man is a mixed bag. I can understand your reticence. Who thinks we need less of the wild man archetype? Less of the yeah, wild man. Yeah. Right? Because it's aggression and it's violence and it's freedom and 
its spontaneity, and its sensuality, and its passion. Oh, well, crap. We can't exactly, oh, did I just wild them my language? Uh, but we can't exactly <laughs> throw the wild baby out with the wild bath water, right? Because everything's kind of mixed in. So what I challenge you, uh, my call to action is supposed to come at the end of the sermon, but I'm going to give you an early one, okay? Spoiler alert, call to action is to look around your culture and notice that you can kind of group some of the messages about how we're going to fix things, because we all need to fix things all the time, um, kind of an Apollonian thing. Look around it and see how many messages about how we're going to fix things are about the imposition of order, the expansion of science. Not a bad thing the use of rationality, the uh, top-down management. If we just figured out the laws that Zeus wants us to follow, then everything would be in harmony. And this is one message. Have you heard this message in, in some way or another? And then there's another message that says, if we just let things follow the course of nature, they would work themselves out. Perhaps, one of these political candidates who I will remain in, who were in English, but somebody said on a little discussion board I was on, you know, if she or he gets it, then I just consider that a cleansing force. You know, maybe things just need to explode for us to see how bad it is. Or perhaps your the problem in your relationship is that there's just not enough self-expression. You're, you're just wrapped up too tight. So, have you heard any of these Dionysian messages? We, you know, we need to let go, we need to let things take their own course, we need to free people, we need more art. Maybe art is the answer. Maybe, you know, not getting rid of music classes at school is the answer. So, who's right? Which, which one's right? Who, who votes for the Apollonian paradigm of fixing the world? If we just had more order, generally opposed from the sun down to the earth, then everybody would get in line, right? Lace up their boots, do up their tie, and get back to work right? to, to fix this place. Or, okay, so we have like two votes for Apollo, right? Who wants to vote for Dionysus? If we just uh, dissolve the regulations that keep Wall Street bound, right? And, you know, then things would just balance themselves back out. Maybe through a little bit of wildness, we might have to, you know, go through a, go through the fire. But that's how. So the trick is when you play who's right, it's uh, you create false dichotomies because they're both right. Now the wonderful thing about these Greek gods is that. No one could hold a Greek god up as the ultimate ideal. Right? Why? They were capricious. Because they were what? Capricious. They were capricious. Okay, what's that's a that's a good word you said you kind of capricious. Yeah, three syllables. Okay. Good <laughs> they were capricious, they were adulterous, they were murderous. Yeah, that you know, all of these things that we don't really want to teach our kids to be, they were. Right? So you can't just say like, and we all like, I don't know, following the ideal of Jesus, personally I think like that's kind of cool, right? You know, oh, he healed the sick, he fed the poor, he, you know, he fought against income inequality, he, he lived his values, he put his life on, on the line, and you're like, and hey, what if you were like Apollo, you know? And, Somebody makes you mad, you know, you can just wipe out their island. That would be cool, right? You know, or, you know, if you like a girl, you just take her. No. I, as your minister, I can tell you, no. Okay. But what the wonderful thing about the Greek gods is that they're a one they're a great snapshot into our own psyche. And we may say to ourselves, well, I would never, uh, what's the form of adulterer? I would never adulter. Some of us would say, I would never adult. Uh, which is, 
Very bad at ICM. Um, but there are elements of these are these are seeds in our psyche. The the part of us that is capable of this kind of activity, the part of us that flies off the handle when somebody, you know, the part of us that, like Apollo, you know, when some, somebody challenged it, Poseidon challenged it to a duel for the sake of uh, one of the side, one of the armies in the Battle of Troy, right? You know, Apollo said, no, I'm not going to risk myself for these mortals. <laughs> that's, that's, that's completely irrational. I'm going to stay back here and just let them work it out. There's a part of each of us that's like that. We may not choose to cultivate it. We may choose to guard ourselves against it. But the more we know that that's a piece of us, the more informed we are in our relationships with ourselves and others. The other cool thing about these is that these Greek gods, right? Dionysus, who's followed, okay, there's no kids in here, they good. So he's followed by this pack of goat men with erect penises, like, just all the day. And these wild, frenzy ladies with like blood dripping down from the raw meat that they just tore into. You know? And it's just like maybe that's not the answer to the ills of our civilization. Right? And yet, if you worked like a, a hard 45 hour to 60 hour week or something like that, we find Dionysus in the party scene that some of us still go to, to ah, just let it all loose, right? We find Dionysus in the Game of Thrones episode that I will watch later tonight. And I will not shame myself about it because it's archetypally sound. And it's horrible. I don't, I don't necessarily recommend watching Game of Thrones if your nervous system is at all sensitive. Um, it's awful, and yet there's something very cleansing and affirming about it because it's tapping into this part of our psyche. As Jung would say, part of our collective psyche. These seeds that have been very deep in each of us, things that we all share in Apollo. Under his most important and influential aspect may be included everything that connects him with law and order. Primarily, he re represented the Greek preference for, quote, the intelligible, determinate, measurable, as opposed to the fantastic, vague, and shapeless. So here we have the measurable, the determinable, and the determinate. Determinate, as opposed to the amorphous, the vague. So Apollo is God of the sun, God of the arts, God of poetry, God of archery. And I like the symbolism of archery, right? Because it's the ultimate sort of kind of way the masculine mind thinks, right? It goes from here to there. And then you reach your target, then you're done. Ah, wow. Goal achieved. This is great. This is, this is Apollo. Okay. He was a lawgiver and a patron of medicine, who could also bring plagues, by the way, and protected herdsmen. So as I was reading through the, the qualities and the sort of mythos of Apollo, I thought, man, this is like every uh, mother with a daughter. This, this guy's the perfect husband. Right? He's a doctor. He's a lawyer. He, you know, he does competitive sports. Right? He's just an upstanding young guy. He sets goals and then he beats them. You know, he's got a tan. <laughs> um, principles that were written down at one of the Paulus temples. Here they are. In case you want to live your life according to an Apoll Apollonian Oh, are you ready? One. No, you don't have to write this down. Curb thy spirit. Observe the limit. Hate hubris. You know what hubris is. It's like pride. It's a most pride thing. Keep a reverent tongue. Fear authority. Bow before the divine. Glory not in strength. Keep with it. So this is the Apollonian code. So we voted for Apollo earlier. This is what you got. And like many, you didn't quite know what you're getting until you voted. So <laughs> so it's not it's not really news to people who are part of a liberal religious 
fellowship that this is the code that we've lived in as a culture for quite a long time. Right? These are the things that are prized in men in particular. And things that are not of this are diminished in men. So we've all inherited the Apollonian code to a certain degree. So the Apollo side, I think, prizes verbal logic, prizes understanding cause and effect, prizes scheduling, accomplishment, winning, and excelling. So this is wonderful. And you can see how these things are really great. Like, if you don't know cause and effect, right, you don't understand that pushing the brakes helps your car not run into the other car, right? Pushing the gas helps your car run into the other car. Spending all your money before your paycheck means that you have to take out a loan with what's it, like 300% interest or some nonsense at the little loan shack down the road, the legal loan shark business, right? Like these are, it's great to know cause and effect. But something happens in our psyche, and you can see this through most of these sort of dominator patriarchy cultures, which are what most of the world has lived under for the last 2,000, 4,000 years or so, that they bring with them the cause and effect of rationality. And then you get all this other stuff of like keeping women under the rule. Right? How that, it just gets, it's like the, you know, it's like the military spending bill. Well, yes, we're gonna support vets, and we're gonna do all of this other stuff too. Just sign on the line, or you don't want those vets to go hungry, right? You can have rationality, you can have cause and effect, and all you have to do is keep your women under wraps. No problem. So, how these get tied up and can we untie them is a sermon for a later time. Uh, one other cool note about Apollo, though, is that at the Temple of Apollo, for uh, three months of the year, Apollo took a vacation. He got one month longer than a traditional New Year minister, uh, and he took it in winter. Um, and he went to the land of the Hyperboreans, which is where the sun, sun, sun shines 24 hours a day. And it was this totally pure, uh, awesome realm. Anyway, while he was gone, his temple was given over to the worship of Dionysus, his brother. So there's this very trippy thing, like Apollo says, keep women under wraps, but for three months of the year, his temple is devoted to these wild women who don't wear no clothes and rip apart uh, raw meat and dance. Cool gals hang out. Okay, <laughs> Dionysus. Dionysus, the god of ecstasy and terror, of wildness and the most blessed deliverance. So Dionysus is a mixed bag too. If he was just the god of ecstasy, I mean, like, cause and effect is okay, but if you had your choice between, like, hey, you could know how everything works, or you could be in total rapture all the time. Like, I think I would think, like, who cares how stuff works? It's like those little, those little rats. I guess that's sort of bull. You know, they learn to press the button to stimulate the orgasm center in their brain, and they just press that button. The rest of the they probably could figure out that they were going to die because they stopped eating. <laughs> stimulate the dopamine growth. Um, but nature in her infinite wisdom has paired, like again, we get this other pairing, right? If you want the ecstasy, you also are going to have to go through the death that eventually comes. You're going to have to learn how to experience the terror that's the other side of that. So Dionysus is very cool. He's of the model that the myth of Jesus follows, in that he is a god who died and was born. And there are different myths about how that happened. One says uh, these titans got a hold of them, and they basically ate everything but the heart. And the heart got sewn into Zeus's thigh. And Zeus limped around for nine months or so, and then Dionysus was born out of his thigh, after being born from his mother. So Dionysus is sometimes called the twice born, or born again. He was brought up as a girl. People who reject Dionysus go insane. He gets initiated to the cult of the great earth goddess Rei, and he becomes a priest of the goddess, like I said before, as well as being a god himself. 
he rescues both Ariadne, remember the lady with the thread and the Minotaur and all that stuff, and eventually became Dionysus' wife, and his mother, and gains immortality for them. He is the only deity in the Greek pantheon who, instead of dominating and basically enslaving them, rescues them and lifts them up. Okay, my notes just says, Maenads! With an exclamation point. So these are the traditional followers of Dionysus, and these are these wild, frenzied women who rip you to shreds some law challenge. Dionysus is the ecstasy both in mystics and in murderers. Both in mystics and in murderers. What does that mean? Does that make sense to you? The ecstasy in both mystics and murderers. There's a, you know, there's a certain type of murderer who, um, in Buddhism, they would call it the happiness which is actually just the suffering of change, right? You have to do something very radical to get yourself to stop thinking about the kind of suffering you're experiencing and just replace it with a different suffering. Um, there's another, though, that you can hear characterized in psychological literature, the, the real psychopath, right? That that rat bliss center in their brain is being stimulated by the act of harming another. But the mystic who can stimulate that themselves, sitting in a cave or walking down the street or serving soup in a soup, soup kitchen, it's the same part of their brain and the same feeling of ecstasy. <coughs> Dionysus can predispose a man to the problem called puer eternus. Have you heard of puer eternus? Not, not the T, not puer. I can drink this forever. No, who are the, I think it's the French, for the little boy. And Peter Pan syndrome, constant little boy syndrome. Okay, so we have, we have an idea, right? We have this one upstanding doctor slash lawyer slash martial artist guy with tan. And we've got this other cross-dressing, wine-drinking, hangs out with, you know, naked babes all day in the woods, in caves, you know, drives people insane. And you're supposed to choose which one do you want to be president of the universe. And it's a stupid question, but what I propose to you, and like, like I spoiler alerted you earlier, I think that's a question that we are often asking. We have a false dichotomy living in us that says it's going to have to be either Apollo or Dionysus. You can either have things settled, calm, peaceful, and orderly, or you can have things totally ecstatic and also completely terrifying. Which one would you like? The rhetoric of the New Age culture, which I am a graduate of, thank goodness, you know, which grows a lot out of the hippie revolution, says, well, you know, you got to go through the terror, but you got to get that ecstasy. And like order is just ridiculous, right? The culture that that grew out of said, like, okay, we don't need so much terror. We are going to sacrifice that for uh, greater security. But we need to sacrifice some freedom for security. You don't mind if we record your phone calls, right? Yeah. Because we're, we're, we're lessening terror. So, which one do you want, people? You want this candidate or the other? It's a really good question, in my opinion. Okay, and here's the quick answer. The rest you have to think about on yourself. Just like with every other typology, types do not equal stages. Types do not equal stages. Meaning, Women are often one way. Oh, I'm not stereotyping. Okay. <laughs> estrogen-based brains. Is that okay? In the womb, you get more estrogen, oxytocin in the brain does one thing, more testosterone in the brain does another thing. The testosterone influenced brain tends to be that archer guy, right? The estrogen influenced brain tends to have an easier time making connections between them. But that doesn't mean one's better than the other, right? They're different types. So different types can exist at different stages. For example, if we had only grown to a tribal level of technology communication community, 
we might have tribal fetishism on one side. The Apollonian vibe that says, oh, wait a minute, did you cast three sticks at the sun this morning? <gasps> you broke the ritual, the sun will never come up tomorrow. My God, order is, well, you know, so rigid, linear tribal fetishism. On the other hand, in every tribe in the world, you've got the, you know, you chew up like yucca roots and you spit them in a jar, and then you just go nuts, like at least once a little. So this is on the tribal level. On the mythic membership level, the culture that uh, we lived in for up until the rational enlightenment, you've got the rules of the church, right? Very much imposed state of order. And then something leaks out underneath that. You get the abuse scandals in the Catholic Church. There was, there was a Dionysian element stuck in those human people that all the rhetoric didn't get to, right? You can preach abstinence in schools all you want in Texas, and you'll still get an extremely high rate of teenage pregnancy. Right? The, Di the Dionysian urge will not be denied. Right? You get things like the Spanish Inquisition. Right? We're creating peace. Our God is a God of peace. But we will kill hundreds of thousands of women in a way that will make the Nazi Holocaust look like uh, chopped liver. So, sorry, I, I get hitched on that mythic membership level of consciousness. Okay? At our level of consciousness, the rational level of consciousness, you've got scienceism on the one side, which is like beginning of the 20th century, the physicists thought they had all the laws of nature figured out, and we just had to figure out new applications for them. You know, oh, there's a couple loose ends we're tying up, and then, they, then we'll be done. This was right before quantum theories started coming. Right before Einstein started publishing, we've got it all figured out. Very Apollonian. On the other side, though, you get in our rational level, soccer hoodlums, Game of Thrones. We've used the internet to publish all this cool Dionysian wildness. You get career life versus living for the weekend. You get establishment policy, politics, versus revolutionary or radical politics. And I bet you can find a friend that will tell you one or the other is better than the other. But the notion is that these can live at different stages of evolution. Rather than throwing away Apollo, rather than throwing away Dionysus, perhaps we can learn that each of these gods lives in each one of us every other person that we look around at. Patriarchal dominator structures support men in being powerful, rational, in control, but doesn't say much about men being sensual, passionate, emotional, or in the now. We need to bring back these Dionysian structures, but we need to bring them in a healthy way. It's not a matter of re-invoking the wild man. Because the wild man brings the full spectrum of consciousness. But understanding that this type isn't necessarily a stage. OK, and then I'm going to read this part because it was cool when I wrote it. I believe if our world is to move forward toward the glory that we are capable of, glory that is just around the corner, we no longer have the luxury of letting these forces remain dormant and driving us unconsciously. I know that we must bring them forth into the light of understanding, and only then will we know peace within and without. And with that, let's stand and sing one.